discretion, used nine times in nine verses of the Bible, the act of sound and right judgment before God and men. Now, the attitude of rebellion has a spiritual root. We'll talk about that in a minute. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. And I'm Janice. You have tuned to the Quick Study Television program. Our purpose is to take viewers through the Bible in one year, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And today, our reading assignment is 2 Samuel chapter 19 to 21, with a focus on chapter 20. We are going to be talking about the disease of rebellion. Just like there are physical diseases, there are actually soulish and spiritual diseases. One of them is rebellion and bitterness. Now we're going to be talking about that and more as we come up on this in just a moment. And we learn the wisdom from God's Word for our daily living. Corey Hembree is here with Bible Archaeology. Corey, what's today? Today we are taking a look at Gibeon of the Gibeonites and we're also going to be exploring some different types of ancient warfare. Gibeon of the Gibeonites, mm -hmm. an ancient warfare, that's a good one right there. All right, we're yeah. going to be looking at that in a moment. Do you know? Yes. Do you know who killed Amasa? Mm. That's a good question. All right, so we're in a time when there's a lot of violence here yes. in the scripture. So. What we need to do is study this and learn the spiritual roots of it so we can guide our lives accordingly and prepare ourselves to understand and to counter violence. But violence reaches into the spiritual realm or the spiritual realm of violence reaches into our realm. Samuel chapter 21 records a very serious and a very sad history. What it is dealing with is there is a famine, there is a three year famine in the land during the reign of King David and King David inquires of the Lord to see why this famine is there and God informs him that it's because King Saul, he broke the covenant agreement that Israel had with the Gibeonites. Now if you'll remember back in the days of Joshua when the invasion of the promised land was first beginning, the Gibeonites tricked Joshua and Israel into making a covenant with them. But even though it was a trick, the covenant was made. And so Israel uh, respected it. The covenant was that Gibeon would serve Israel, but Israel would not try to overtake the Gibeonites. And Saul overstepped this. So you can read about that history in 2 Samuel 21. Right now, you and I are going to take a look at Gibeon. A number of important events went on at the city of Gibeon. After the Gibeonites had tricked Israel into a treaty with them, the surrounding kings were understandably angered. They joined forces and marched against Gibeon. This battle sets the stage for an Israelite victory and for the famous stopping of the sun called for by Joshua. Gibeon was known for its abundant water supply, boasting one major and seven minor springs, and what the Bible calls the Great Pool of Gibeon. Today, it is safe to say that this pool has been found. At the archaeological site of the ancient city is this massive pool. 82 feet deep and 37 feet wide, it is a giant cistern cut into solid rock. Traveling down into it via staircase, 
There is a tunnel to connect it with another chamber at groundwater level. The chamber is fed by a spring outside of the city. Here at the Pool of Gibeon, King David's defeat of Saul's son Ishbosheth began after a bloody showdown. The size and advantage this pool gave to its city made it the perfect landmark for historians recording events and made it a great meeting place for the ancients. It's time to explore the wise guys of the Bible and they are all around us. Now it is one thing to stand up against evil, it is another to be its slave through needless rebellion. Now in 1023 BC, after the costly bloody civil war, in ancient Israel the atmosphere was rife with rebellion and rich with subversion. A very unwise guy named Sheba, the son of Bahrai, for no other reason than selfishness, simply declared a rebellion against King David. The unwisdom continued with yet another named Abishai. He also rebelled and was another very unwise guy. This is a mess that moral rebellion always creates in selfish, needless rebellion. Second Samuel 20, 1 through 10. And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no share in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah, from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. Now David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in seclusion and supported them, but did not go in to them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. And the king said to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah for me within three days and be present here yourself. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba the son of Bichri will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. So Joab's men, with the Cherethites, the Pelethites, and all the mighty men, went out after him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. When they were at the large stone which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. Now Joab was dressed in battle armor. On it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at his hips. And as he was going forward, it fell out. Then Joab said to Amasa, Are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand, and he struck him with it in the stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground, and he did not strike him again. Thus he died. Then Joab and Abishai his brother pursued Sheba the son of Bichri. 2 Samuel chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. As we study through the book, highlighting the kings in Samuel, 2 Samuel to be specific, and then we'll go into the first kings and then the second kings, we learn some wisdom from the scripture. Now, so far, we know that David is taking control of the kingdom. He finally overcame, but David wisely dealt with Saul and his household with gentleness. 
But what happened was David's own son rebelled against him because he didn't really enforce God's word properly with his sons. Absalom rebels and he gets killed as a result by Joab. And so now in today's scripture, there is an atmosphere. There is a spiritual atmosphere of rebellion in the nation. This always happens. It's called an authority crisis. And in much of the Western world today, the entire, our entire societies are in this authority crisis, the spell of rebellion. And we're going to learn some wisdom today on how to deal with that and how to identify it. So we go to 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1, where it says, And there happened to be in David's kingdom there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bechri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and he said, We have no share in David, nor do we have any inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his own tent, O Israel. And so every man departed David and followed Sheba, the son of Bechri. But men of Judah from Jordan as far as Jerusalem remained loyal to their king. Now I want you to notice here the atmosphere of rebellion. Because again, like anger, rebellion has a spiritual root. And that's our, set, our first uh, study wise point. Rebellion has a spiritual root that moves in the atmosphere of mobs and moods. Mobs and moods. And so whenever you see a bunch of people protesting in rebellion and there's violence there, this has a spiritual root to it. This is not merely, you know, just the intellective mind running around, it's just, and it's not always good. And so we understand that the first rule of heaven is order, and that order is under authority, not being the authority of everything. And so here we see this atmosphere, this spirit, running in mobs and moods. Now that's how we identify it. How do you break up the mobs? We'll get to that in a moment. 2 Samuel verse 3, 20 verse 3, it says this. Now David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left in his house. Absalom actually had taken them. That was a sign of denouncing David's authority. And he put them in seclusion, and he supported them, but he did not go into them. And so they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. Here's another uh, consequence of rebellion. Rebellion destroys people and brings division and seclusion to our souls. And beloved, have we not seen that with the rise of competitive denominationalism in church? The church has become divided. Have we not seen that? It, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a reason to create a new uh, denomination becomes a rebellion. And that spirit of rebellion is so root, uh, root that separates us and that isolates us. That is not what the gifts of the Spirit were for, and that's not what God's plan for the church is. How do we deal with it? Well, come back to that. Let's go back to the Scripture. Verse 4 says, And the king said to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah for me within three days, and present yourself here. And so Amasa, he went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the time which David had appointed him. Here again, Amasa is rebelling and creating a conspiracy. And David said to Abishai, Abishai, I now, Sheba, the son of Bachri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue them, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape to us. So Joab's men with these Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men went out after him. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bachri. And when they were at large, at a large stone, which is in Gibeah and Amasa, came before them, and now Joab was dressed in battle armor, and on it was a belt with a sword fashioned with a sheath, sheath at his hips. And as he was going forward, it fell out. It was planned, you see, verse 9. And then Joab said to Amasa, How are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him, but Amasa did not notice the sword was in Joab's hand, and he struck him with the sword in the stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground, and he did not strike him again, thus he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bachri. Beloved rebellion has gone crazy, even in Joab. And so here we see rebellion unchecked always brings violence and destruction to the people, places, and things it surrounds. Now we've learned all of the conditions and the sickness and the, and the, and the, the symptoms of rebellion. But the Bible says very carefully, that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. David had learned when Saul was in pursuit of him not to pursue Saul. 
Joab didn't know that. And this atmosphere, once again, that same atmosphere that was in Saul pursuing David emerges again and comes back to haunt David because David had made this military machine. I can't think of a statement that is more unwise than fight fire with fire. You don't fight fire with fire. You fight fire with water. People say, well, yeah, you use explosions sometimes to put fire out. That's not fighting fire with fire. Uh, that's a shockwave. That's a totally different deal. That's like the judgment of God. And so the hardest thing that we will ever do as people, when people are in rebellion and they insult our authority, I'm talking about uh, business bosses right now and church leaders and government officials, when you have the spirit of rebellion, you must always approach the throne of grace like Moses did. And you must say, Lord, I need some help here and fight fire with water. And in today's world where we are in an authority crisis in the West, it is up to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to repent, fall on its knees and say, Lord, we have rebellion in the land. The air is full of it. We come to you and ask you to save us and, and get it out of our hearts. The culture of rebellion. This is the wisdom that comes from the kings of Israel. Now our reading today comes from the book of 2 Samuel, and 2 Samuel is placed within the history books of the Bible. So there is a lot of warfare during the books of 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, and 1 and 2 Chronicles because of the nature of it as history, and the time period was just full of uh, fighting and warriors. So there's a lot of war stories that are very brutal, but there are truths contained within them that are cross-cultural, and they go across time as well. Right now, you and I are going to focus in on one tactic of warfare that you will read about references to it within the scriptures. And that of course is the tactic of siege warfare. In order to gain control of a city, an attacking army could surround the city, holding the citizens hostage inside. This is the beginning stages of siege warfare. A siege could progress in many different ways after all the outside supplies and communications of the city had been cut off. An army could try to trick and lure out the fighting men of a city, luring them into an ambush. They could employ sappers, men to dig tunnels underneath the city's walls. They would often dig trenches around the city and could even simply wait for the inhabitants to begin to starve and hopefully surrender. A forceful route could be taken, building siege ramps up to the city walls and gates. This is what the ancient Assyrians and Romans were famous for. The walls could be scaled using ladders, the most dangerous approach, but quick and sometimes effective as seen on the carved walls of ancient Egypt. Early on in history, battering rams with covered frames were invented for sieges. They were heavy, metal-tipped logs used to break open a gate or even a part of the wall. To be put to siege was not a good situation to find yourself in. There were ways to fight back, but the attacking armies often came prepared to wait. Babylon's siege of Tyre lasted 13 years. Quick Study Television offers the Quick Study Wise Guide. It is a print companion to this program. With daily commentary, the Study Wise Notes, Wise Guides commentary, and much more. But we need your help to stay in production. When you support in any amount regularly, we can send you this beautiful monthly guide automatically every month. If you give online, you can also automatically download the guide when you give. 
To help us out and keep Quick Study strong in the month of February, please write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also support online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Thank you in advance. We need your help today. You know, we're going through the rise and the fall of the kings. And as we progress through Israel's history, uh, the nation will split uh, after Solomon. And that split will go to the north ten tribes called Israel, to the south, the remaining two tribes called Judah. Mm -hmm. And so there's the rise and the fall of kings. And so as we put this all together, we're trying to learn wisdom from it. Now today you have an interesting question. Yes. And it's in our Do You Know Sec. And it's got a very interesting accounting and behind it. Um, do you know who killed Amasa? All right. Mm -hmm. So, Corey, we have this person, Amasa, in the Bible. Who killed Amasa, mm -hmm. Corey? Okay, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, that the answer is Joab. And I, be I believe, I could be getting uh, my histories mixed up, but I think he, he grabs him by the beard as if to kiss him, and then he stabs him and uh, basically debowels him, takes out his intestines. Mm -hmm. Is she right? She is right. And um, I'll tell you, it was quite the setup. If you read this, the, the accounting of this carefully, you can see how Joab was very devious in his entire approach to Amasa. Because the scripture says in verse 8, I believe it is, that as he was walking forward, his sword falls out of its sheath. It just accidentally falls out. So if you can imagine, as he's approaching Amasa, um, this falling out of the sword would have just sort of been, oh, well, it fell out, out so I'm, I'm just going to pick it up. Joab's going to pick up the sword and have it in his hand. And he says to Amasa, oh, brother, how is your health? And to touch another man's beard was very, um, a, you didn't do that. That was very, a, 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 violation, a, a violation of violation. serious personal That's right. space unless you were a good friend and you would just gently grab it and, and kiss the cheek. This is what Amasa thought was going to happen because of him asking, oh, brother, how is your health? Um, and probably he didn't even notice the sword because Joab had just sort of dropped it and picked it up. And instead of kissing him, of course, um, he did what Corey said and used this sword to, to um, basically... Did David's not happy about Masha? this. Not at David's all. trying to trying to to make peace. Yes. And but these men have been trained in violence That's and more. Right. There was a military machine that was created, and to try to gain the discipline of that military machine was nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and not only that, but now you see the deviousness of it. And I'll tell you what. There, there is a lot of wisdom here in looking at this and understanding. It's a really brutal time. It, it's a brutal time. They just time. left him on the road and and said, this and, you know. and this is David's kingdom mm -hmm. and and David's the psalmist of Israel, and and so here we have David's not happy about this. In fact, uh, he says to his son Solomon, you know, when he's about ready to go uh, be gathered together with his father, he said. You know these guys, Joab and his brother, these men are too violent for me. You deal with them accordingly. Right. And Solomon did, I'll tell you, he did too. But these lessons are important for us to learn because the Bible commits itself. The Bible is not propaganda for Israel mm -hmm. and it's not propaganda for Christians. The Bible commits itself to truth. So the good, the bad, and the ugly mm -hmm. are exposed in full view. Yes. That's what you would expect a book of truth to do. And so here we see what happens, and that's why the Bible says in Deuteronomy 13, kings should not multiply wives, mm -hmm. silver or gold or horses. Or horses. Make right. war for machines, war. Yeah. Uh, according to God's, uh, God's requirement for kings. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, Janice, we're taking time yes. in the month of April to call upon the name of the Lord. And I, I wrote this in the March discovery letter. If you're on the mailing list and got the discovery letter, there are many gods frequenting today's world, fallen angels who have assumed various ideas and positions. But I want to be absolutely clear upon the God in which we call on this program. His name is Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. He is, of course, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. And we're calling upon the name of that God. Now, Marianne writes to us from Pennsylvania. And she simply says, would you just pray for Charles? 
Now, Marianne, I don't know what's wrong, but I know that God knows what's wrong, and we're going to pray for him. And then Catherine calls from California, and she says, would you please pray for my reoccurring cancer? So in Jesus' name, mm -hmm. Catherine, in California, I bless you to receive God's blessing of healing. And I pray for you that God would touch you and heal you. Marianne, I pray for Charles in Jesus' name, that God would have his way in the life and in the workings of Charles, and that Jesus Christ would heal. And I bless you to receive what God has for you in Jesus' name. Here is Call to Prayer. In the last 100 years, more destructive wars have been fought in the name of political pursuits and pursuit of peace than all of history. The first two world wars just in the last century are a good example. World War I was supposed to be the war that ended all wars, as was World War II. War is an invention of man, not of God. It is caused by our purposeful rebellion against the principles of God's Word. His protective custody for our souls is in His Word and is designed by Him to keep us from evil. God's Word and wisdom is at work in us when we realize that our souls need the discipline of the Holy Spirit. We are wise not to rebel against Him. So today we pray, Lord, help me to remember that Your Word heals and protects us from destruction. Help me not to live in rebellion against that Word. It is our commitment to not only go through the Bible, but also through the book of Proverbs. So today our reading is Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16, where it says, a fool's wrath is known at once, but a prudent man covers shame. You know what that means? That means self-control. Now that's very important. Did you know that self-control is what we call one of the fruits of the Spirit? Now what does that mean? It means when you bring your life and you surrender your life to Jesus Christ because you have recognized that, that, well, that you're a sinner and that you need a savior. And the Bible says it's not about giving offerings or joining a church or any of that. It, no, it's about your personal decision of coming to Christ. And when you do that, you have a deposit of God's Holy Spirit. He begins to transform your life. You become a disciple of Jesus. And he grows certain virtues and attitudes in you. And they are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, and faith, meekness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. God will grow us if we surrender to Him, to who He wants us to be. We'll change the world. Home group leaders, find out more about taking your faith to the next level and studying the Bible online. With online training from Bible Discovery Seminary, Brought to you by Phoenix University of Theology. For more information, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com.